Okay, I think we're ready to begin. Um, can everyone hear me? Oh, yes, I need. Yep. Takes a while to get everything set up. Now I got my chat showing. Um, so, what I'll do today is first talk about some non related big data stuff, and then we'll go on to questions, and then we'll go back to. Um, Dealing with Spark and AWS. So let me Okay, so This weekend, I was thinking about the spread of the virus and why it's so important to be um, isolated. And so I ran some very simple simulations. And so here, I'm assuming that we contact, you know, say 20 people per day. And those who come in contact with you infect 10%. And the problem with this virus is that no one is immune. Um, and so we start off with one person, and the next day um, we've infected two people. And basically, by the end of the week, we're, or two weeks almost, or like 300,000 cases, new cases. Of course, this is simplistic in the sense of as more and more people get infected, it becomes harder and harder to infect other people. Um, but when you look at it, uh, if half the population is immune, um, you know, at the very end, you know, we're looking at you know, maybe 2,000 cases. Um, and then once they reach, you know, the high immunity rate, um, the virus spreads very slowly. And so the one difference between this virus and say the cold or the flu is many people had the cold or flu last year and so are likely immune to cold or flu this year. Thus we have a, um, a shot we can get to boost immunity. Um, And then um, we look at how isolating ourselves helps. And the first, I'm assuming again, no one's immune, um, and you only meet five people a day, and again, you infect 10% of them. And so you can see, right, this first column, right, it's, you know, by the end of the second week, we've infected. 43 people. If you contact 10 people, it's up to 2,000. 20 people, 300,000. Contact 25 people each. Um, in the two weeks, you've basically infected all of San Diego County. Um, now, um, you know, one student sent me a, a good reference on understanding all this. Um, and here is a full URL. Here is a tiny URL for you if you're interested. Um, it's actually a very good site. Um, and yeah, they're assuming that the rate of infection is 2.5%. Um, and so at that rate, we're talking about, you know, almost 100 million cases in the United States, and we need almost 5 million people in the hospital. Um, and the 
should. And you've probably all seen this crazy flattening the curve. Um, what we're trying to do is um, slow the spread of disease and so that fewer people need to be hospitalized. But notice as that curve goes down, we're extending the time it's going to take to go back to somewhat normal. Um, this is probably why um, school announced that summer session will be held all in line two. Um, I suspect that people in a high risk group like myself may not be allowed on campus in the fall and have to do online courses also. Um, I actually asked um, campus, look at Bismarck, the machine in my office, we turn in your assignments, goes down. Can I just go into campus and reboot it? And the answer was, let us know when that happens and we'll do it for you. And in the same site, you know, another graphic, basically, um, you know, what happens if we delay social distancing by, you know, one day um, in terms of total number of cases, and there's a 40% difference. In part because we get this exponential curve where every person is affecting more people, uh, particularly if you're asymptomatic or just seems like we got the flu. I'm sure many of you have seen similar such sites, but this is a pretty good one. And now, there's something slightly different. Um, I try and go through several audiobooks a month just to keep up with general things. And so this month I'm reading a book called Why We Sleep. Well, I should say I'm listening to the book. Um, and it's written by, you know, Matthew Walk Walker, who's a professor at UC Berkeley, and you know, has high credentials. And the first relevant thing is, you know, claims not getting enough sleep harms your immune system. And so they cited a number of different um, studies. And one study, um, what they did is they, they took a bunch of participants, broke them into two groups. One group got a full night's sleep. Another group, they only allowed them to have, you know, six hours less of sleep. And then to see how well they did, they took live um, cold virus and they sprayed it up their noses to see who would get sick. 50% um, of the people who did not get a full night's sleep, this is a one night's sleep, um, came down to the cold, and other people who got a full night's sleep, only 12%. So, try and get a full night's sleep, and that's, Again, that was just one night with not enough sleep. They also did a number of other studies on learning. Um, it turned out that when you sleep, there's two different types of sleep you have. Um, one is called REM or rapid eye movement. Uh, basically, because your eyes start moving back and forth. And, you know, that's typically when you're dreaming, it's lighter sleep. And the other type of sleep, which is um, not, not creatively named, is called non-REM sleep or NREM sleep. And it turns out that during non-REM sleep, um, that's when your brain takes memories from basically short-term memory and transfers them to long-term memory. Um, and they know this in a number of different ways. 
One is you put people in MR machines and see what part of the brains are active during sleep. Another one is they torture people by not letting them get any very much non-REM sleep. Then they you teach them words or puzzles, various things, and well, the end of sleep and the test the next day, following days. Um, but it turns out that um, if you don't get enough non-REM sleep, um, you don't learn as well. You don't re remember what you've learned very well. And, and the hard thing to hear, particularly for computer science people and students is that when you sleep, um, you first go into non-REM sleep, and then primary non-REM sleep, and then later towards morning, you go into REM sleep. And what happens when you go to bed later than normal, it's not that you compress everything or you shift um, the non-REM and REM sleep forward. No, you just shorten how much um, non-REM sleep you get which means if you, you know, study late into the night beyond where you normally go to sleep, um, your brain doesn't have as much time to take what you've learned from short-term memory into long-term memory. And I'm trying to figure out what that means for teaching. Um, the Walker one is that Harvard, um, he said already did, it's divided his courses into three sections and gave three separate exams and they're non-accumulative to make sure students would try and cram as much. And he was asked to give a um, this article in the student newspaper and he explained all these things and said, well, students, it's not your fault, it's our faculty fault because we, we make you cram. Um, he said he was no longer allowed to post articles from newspaper. Someone didn't like what he said. So I think in this time, you really want to make an effort to get a full night's sleep regularly. Um, it, it does affect your immune system. Okay, any questions? Um, got assignment three, assignment two. Well, as you know, we're still experimenting, trying to figure out how to do things. So if things aren't working in this class for you or other classes, please let us know. Um, and I do have one request. It would be nice if at least one person would share that or turn on their camera so I can at least see one person. Um, otherwise, I'm sort of talking. To, yes, <laughs> it's sort of nice to see people, right? Um, otherwise, I feel like I'm just talking in the void. Um, it's hard to believe that um, radio announcers, they must be used to it. But, Okay, so far no questions. Do you have a question? Yeah. Um, when could we expect our grades back for assignment one? Um, my plan is as soon as Thursday's over, I get to spend all spring break grading and everything. Okay. Cool. Yes. I, 
I got behind this semester and the world is actively keeping me behind. I was hoping to start today, but yesterday morning I woke up and we there's a section of my house with an add-on, so it's got a flat roof and I had water on the floor. Oh my gosh. So I didn't get to start to work until about two o'clock. I had to take care of that. So I was Some other universe doesn't want me to get caught up. But spring break is next week. Any other questions, issues? Now I do want to say there were a lot of issues, at least some people came up with during the assignment, right? Um, how do we create different, um, can we create one ACFI file for all the systems and why not? Um, people ran into memory limitations. Um, you know, those problems with, um, you know, they changed the file format, right? I mean, there are some of this data. Um, there was at least one file where they had two extra columns in the data, which meant when you read it in, the column headers were all set incorrectly. Um, it's very frustrating when you're doing assignment, but this is what happens. Um, you know, the old saying is that a data scientist um, spends 80% of their time cleaning up data and the other 20% complaining about how dirty the data is. Um, okay, well, let's um, go back. And we want The last time we ended um, looking at machine learning, um, you know, just trying to motivate uh, neural networks. Um, and so we had some sort of, you know, function we're trying to you know, we're trying to try and figure out this this function. We we have some training data that tells us, um, given some x one, x two, what the function value is, and now we're trying to figure out what these weights and the biases. Um, and so basically, using gradient descent, which is a common technique, what we have to do is uh, we, we take the derivative activation function to give us a slope. Um, we then use a the slope in the different dimensions to go for you know, one way closer to an answer on the curve, and then we um, use that to do with the function and try again and over and over again. Um, and the problem is, um, you know, if we take the slope here, right? It's going to shoot us way over here, which may be too far. And so then when we take the derivative, we, we don't want to go um, as far, too far away. Um, so in that case, right, what we want to do is um, you know, learning rate, which allows us to limit how far we go down on the slope. Um, And so now we've got you know, standard terms, a loss function, an activation function, a learning rate, um, and our weights and our bias. And you know, so we just repeat this over and over again. So we you know select initial values, 
Um, compute the loss function, find how bad off we are. Um, update two weights. Again, we take the derivative activation function, get its gradient, um, and we then update w1, w2 by giving this formula. Um, we update the bias. And now we compute the loss function on those new weights and repeat over and over again until we hopefully converge on the solution. And it gives us lots of different um, other levers we can pull and push. Um, no, so the learning rate's too small, it takes too long to progress. If it's too big, we jump around too much, you know, convert. Um, and of course, now we do this not manually, but we do with the neuron. Um, and so the neuron is going to do this for us. We have a bunch of input weights, inputs. Um, and each one we've got a weight. Um, and we combine them and then an evaluative activation function and I'll put a new value. And this is um, there are lots of different different systems allow us to implement neural network. This one it's not implemented in Python. Um, it's actually Julie implementation. And the nice thing is, it's like, oh, you define your activation function, your loss function, um, there's a gradient function, compute the gradient. Um, and then it's, you know, the algorithm is pretty clean here because now I, um, Use the data and the learning rate. I can iterate over the data um, and compute changes in our weights um, and then change. So it makes the algorithm quite clear, whereas in lots of systems, you can say, I can need so many neurons. Um, so that's why I like it because it really is just shows you the basic idea very cleanly. Um, and I don't know about you, but whenever I learn something like this, it's like, yeah, it sounds good, but I don't have any intuition. And so I really want intuition, um, run examples to show me how, how it actually works. Um, you know, so I created a simple little example um, and then ran the loop for iterations. And I am using exact data um, and I just put sort of semi reasonable weights to start with. Um, and after 20 iterations, our know, loss is down to 0 0.001. Um, and the weights were um, 2.09 and 2.9, but the actual values should be two and three, so we're pretty close after just 20 iterations. Um, varying the learning rates, you know, for 20 iterations, the learning rate was 0 0.01. Um, we didn't converge quite as fast. Why? Because we're taking two small steps down the curve. Um, the learning rate was 0 0.1. Um, after 20 iterations, we got pretty close to the result. Um, and the learning light was one. Um, we're jumping all over the place. And so when we're done, 
we're just way, way off, and our weights are really just crazy. All right, so it just shows you that this is one of the levers we can tweak. Um, if it's too small, like they say, uh, we're going to have to iterate um, much longer. And if it's too big, we're just going to jump all over the place and we'll never converge. Um, we can't find it. Let me. This is document 18, clustering, slide 43. Does that help? And just picking another set of starting points. Um, we converge pretty fast, but not quite as close as we were before. And 20 iterations. Um, and the same learning rate, again, just starting further away. Um, and we're converging pretty well, but we need more than 20 iterations that are sort of too far away. Um, Again, just examples to show that where we start this, the weights um, has a big impact, learning weight has a big impact. So some of the basic parameters for our you know, number of input weights and learning rates. So, you know, typically we want to use different types of neurons and we put them in layers. Um, and we use different types of activation functions. You know, what this allows us to do is all these outliers are basically treated the same. It allows us to focus in on you know, just these values. And another similar um, function is different. Um, basically, treat all these values as the same and then everything else linearly. And you can also normalize things. The clock max is often used. Um, on the output of the neuron to make sure that our data um, stays as it, or extreme values don't um, offset things. There's various loss functions, and people are creating more of them. Um, so now we have. Uh, input weight, learning rate, or loss function, activation functions, and all these be varied. Um, and how do we know which one are best for our situation? Well, if you think that assignment two has had a long running time, just wait until you try and run some neural networks. Um, these things can run for days when you're training them. Um, and so, yeah, so we typically have our input layers, right? And the values are layer, a bunch of hidden layers, and then an output layer. And so basically, that basic algorithm I explained you know, a few minutes ago is, is what neural networks are doing over and over again. We're picking you know, different loss functions, different weights, different learning rates, um, you know, various parameters, how many 
input layers you need, how many hidden layers you want. Um, you know, and all this, right, is done in each one of these neurons, well, each one of these neurons, right? And so that one algorithm I, I showed you um, is being done in each of the neurons, each of the layers. And another um, terms for propagation where all the data flows from one end to the other end. Um, so a neuron gets its inputs and then it sends output to all the neurons in the next layer. Um, and so back propagation is you can then sort of back propagate um, with just the weights um, and pushing it backwards. Um, now we've got a longer list of knobs we can turn. Um, and I always have to remind people that if you're careful with fitting, we've got that many knobs you can turn. If you start turning them in time, times, you'll get something that gives you a really good answer, but it may not fit the model. Um, and one of the problems with neural networks is, as opposed to say, linear regression, is that linear regression, we can sort of, this lower dimension, sort of look at the data and see, oh, is this linear or not? And with neurons, it's hard to see what's going on. Um, so there's a whole bunch of things we, you know, we can, we can, we can tweak with neural networks. And so often we'll divide the whole best into three parts for training data, validation of test. Um, and then we get this crazy um, workflow, which can take days and days and run. Um, now, if we actually want to do something in the neural networks, we need to map the input into a vector so we can pass it onto our networks and our neurons. Um, you know, so if we're looking at images, um, you know, if we look at pixel by pixel in an, in an image, you know, maybe we'll score by uh, grayscale and then we can convert it into, right, a vector of the grayscale um, and this one shows you the one is black and 0.5 is gray. And then we have this a little vector, right? Um, now keep in mind, these are pixels in the image, right? So if I have a four pixel by four pixel image, I get a vector of 16 inputs. Um, if I've got an image of 32 pixels by 32 pixels with RGB and we want to have the colors, um, then we need 3,000 weights, right? Um, so we have an input vector um, size of 3,000. Um, if we have, I mean, 32 by 32 pixels is like a thumbnail sketch, right? It's like an icon. Um, if you have 200 pixels or 200 pixels, we're talking about 
you know, 100,000 weights. We get 100,000, our input is an effect of 100,000 elements. Um, and some people have like 100 layers. Um, and you're starting with input of 100,000 vectors. Um, This is why when people are training neural networks, it's a common thing to do is to get um, a bank of GPUs, um, and then you run the algorithm on GPUs. Um, and even today, people um, are building special purpose hardware just to run neural networks. Deep learning is just more layers, which means they conquer. Um, now there's a you know, bunch of different network configurations they use for neurons. Um, I mean, we could spend, you know, we do have a semester long course on neural networks. And so these things get very complicated um, and very time consuming. And the whole world here is there is this database of handwritten digits. And they've got 60,000 images, and they're all 20 by 20, and the grayscales, and then you can run a neural network on that. And here's a sample of some of the handwritten ones. Well, here's a chart looking at different um, error rates for different types of algorithms. Um, you know, the K nearest neighbor clustering error rate, you know, like your data set was 0.5. Um, various neural networks, you know, get close, deep networks are better. Um, the convolution network is even much better, right? Um, but they involve a lot more computation um, to get that improved accuracy. And I have to warn students in the past, students, oh, I'm going to do some sort of neural network for my project. And they have to prepare for how long it's going to take to, to, to train the network. Um, Spark does have a deep learning. Um, they've got for, you know, feed forward and backward propagation, and they give you a bunch of hyperparameter gene set. And again, it's Using it on Spark is pretty simple. I mean, here's a sample program. Again, it's the same process we've seen before. We um, have to convert it to the right you know, format, the vector assembly. Um, we've got a pipeline, and then we're going to you know, create our training data and test data. And all right, here's our multi-layer precipitron calcifier. Um, 
and retrain it. And then we can look at our test information and see how well we did. And on this small data set, we did pretty good. And then looking at you know some results, um, again we we got pretty good results. So far, so good. Again, it's just if you've taken a machine learning course or you've done taken you know new level course, all this is like. Very simple elementary, but if you haven't, um, you sh these days you should not graduate um, a degree in computer science and not know what those terms are, right? It's, it's that important. Okay, um, on to document 19. Um, all right, so it's document 19, Spark on AWS, and it's a little while we sleep. Um, and I have to get it on. Okay. I want to talk about how we can run a Spark application in AWS. Um, this is something that everyone should do. Um, with everyone in class to do. So you can put in your resume, I know how to use AWS and I can run Spark applications. Um, and there's a bunch of tools you can use. Um, you can create a cluster of machines, run them. There's a free tour when you sign up for the very first time, they give you a bunch of stuff for free. Um, I got charged last year, I'm not quite sure why. I did put, I don't know how many gigabytes of files on S3 and everyone downloaded from their account, but it didn't cost too much. You can get a $100 credit for AWS by going to this site. Um, and then you look, after you log in and request, request an account, and you need to set up an AWS account. Um, when we're setting up machines on AWS, we've got a wide range of machines you can, you can choose. Um, and I just selected a few different types. And you, when you run it, you can ask it to run it now, um, which is the on-demand. You can also ask for this to run it later. So when they've got free time, um, they'll run, run the job for you. And the cost is significantly lower. Um, although, even at this large, it's costing you just about 10 cents an hour. But keep in mind when you run a cluster, we're not talking about 10 cents per hour per cluster. We're talking about 10 cents an hour per machine. All right. Um, so if you have a cluster of 10 machines and you run it for an hour, um, then it's going to cost you a dollar. Also, if you did what I did this morning to test it out again, what I did was ran a couple of small programs and stopped it. I did not run for an entire hour. They will bill me for the entire hour. If you take it 61 minutes, you get billed for two hours. Um, and if you forget to terminate your cluster, when you go to bed, well, it's going to run and say, turn it off. I'm going to charge you for it. 
Um, that's why you always want to run right the um, the programs locally first. Make sure they run, so you're not debugging remotely. Um, and then when you're ready, we can upload your program to S3. And then you have to launch the management console, create a cluster, tell how what libraries you want to use. Um, and we'll go through that. Okay, Amazon uses what they call S3, which is their file system. Um, you create buckets and you put your files inside a bucket. The bucket names are global. Um, so I create a small number of buckets, which I don't delete because then if I delete them, then someone else can pick the name up. Um, And when I say global, I don't mean global to me, I mean global to everyone on S3. Um, and when you go to the S3 console, right, you're going to have this create bucket button you can use to click on it, create a button. A new bucket, um, and I ever saw mine with RW, it seemed to work. Any clashes, and then you get you know, you create it, you need a bucket name, a region you want it in, um, and if you've got settings from other buckets, you can copy it because you can set protection levels. Um, there's been a, f a few famous cases where some government agency decides to store all their data on Amazon and it's forgot to check the settings on who could read the buckets. Yes, and it was world readable. <laughs> and the na names are globally accessible. Um, you don't want to make that mistake. Um, it's no big deal if it happens in assignment, but if you're working and you put the company data in a publicly available site, you could be in trouble. S3 costs are pretty cheap. Um, actually, it's um, the number of backup systems which you use S3 in the back end is so cheap. Um, if you've got under 50 terabytes, they'll charge you basically two cents per gigabyte per month for needed access. Um, if it's infrequent, it goes down to less, um, about a penny. And if you really don't, if it's really just for backups and you only access it in emergencies, the cost will go, you know, point zero zero four cents per gigabyte. Um, So it's, you know, there are a number of files that keep on there permanently because they're so small that they never build them. Um, when you put something in S3, you, in S3 objects, um, it contains the data, the metadata. Um, you can go up to five gigabytes, um, and the data is just bytes. They don't structure in any way. It means whatever you want it to mean. Um, the metadata is basically you know, some of the standard HTTP headers, like content type. Um, your bucket names, right? 
when you put as many buckets, many objects in each bucket as you want, you only get to 100 buckets. Um, and then your name seems pretty long, but you can't duplicate names. So if you try and create a bucket with one of the names I use my buckets, it won't allow you to do that. Um, and again, a bunch of naming conventions for bucket names. Um, and they give each object or file you put into a bucket a key. Um, and then they'll give you a way to access it by um, that key. We'll see that later. There's an access control list. Um, which allows you who can read and write to it. Um, if you're doing sensitive data, you may you want to make sure that you um, set the correct um, access control list. And you probably should experiment with that before you start putting um, secure data in S3. Okay. Um, This is going to take some explanation, and so we're going to go through um, more detail. Um, when you update data in an object or a file in a bucket, those updates are atomic, which is good. But um, this is a big deal. All right, um, but if you do a read immediately after doing the write, you may get the old value. And there's no locking, right? No locking. So if you've got two processes trying to write to the same file, same time, um, one can cover the other. Okay, now we need to talk about the CAP theorem. Um, if we got a distributed system, right, we've got you know, different machines in the system that are sharing data. Um, there are three things we want. Consistency, that is we want all the machines have the same piece of data at the same time, right? So if I update a piece of data on one machine, I want all the other machines to have that update and be consistent across all the machines. Um, availability is that we want to be able to access the data. Um, and the third thing is what happens if a machine goes down or there's another problem um, so that our cluster is divided into several pieces. So we want the data to be consistent and we want it available as possible. And when something goes wrong with our network, we, we want their network to be tolerated. And the CAP theorem says, you can't have all three. You have to give on, on one of them. So let's say we've got two machines, and they both have a, one piece of data. Um, a, and we start off both machines with the same value. Um, now, I write a machine two and update the value to three. It's going to take time to send right the data from machine two to machine three. So there will be a time when the two machines do not have the same value because we can't atomically change the value on both machines at the same time. 
So we're not consistent here, right? Um, partition. What happens if the some reason machine one, machine two can't communicate with each other? Um, how do we know? Um, and there's no connection, a busy connection, a slow connection, a busy machine. No, we can't, right? Um, that brings up latency. It's just the delay that take you go from when they make a request on one machine to get the response from the other machine. And all systems have latency. I don't care how fast your machines are. I don't care if you've got the highest fiber interconnect between the two machines. It still takes light some time to go from one machine to the other, and it's going to take time um, for message to be read. Um, so in practice, um, by a partition, what we mean is we waited long enough. We're impatient, so we're going to assume things go up and down. The machine, machine we can't talk to is gone. Um, so usually, by partition, we mean oh, the delay, latency has gotten too high, and so we'll assume that machine, machine is no longer there. Um, availability. So again, we've got. Um, And then what happens if there's a um, machine two is not available? What does it mean? Well, it means no connection, so connection. What's the difference? Doesn't matter, right? Um, if the client is trying to talk to machine two, it can't access the value. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's a slow connection, machine is busy, or machine is down. Um, and we just pick a time frame and say once the time, once the answer doesn't get back in small time, we'll assume that machine is no longer available. Um, but yeah, so in practice, right, availability and latency basically um, are related. Okay, so now let's talk about we can't have consistency and low latency at the same time. Um, so here we're gonna we're going to favor consistency over latency. Um, so machine one, I set A to be three. Um, but before I can do that, if I want to make sure things are consistent, um, I first have to lock A on both machines. So that no one, if I don't lock it while I'm writing to one machine, then someone could be reading from the other machine and get an inconsistent result. And this is going to take time because if I'm going to set A to machine one to three, then Machine one has to tell machine two, lock A, get the response back to make sure it's locked, and now it can go forward. Um, now we can set A to the three, um, and we can send it both machines, and then we can unlock it. So we get consistency. There's no chance that someone can come in and get read A and get one person can get one value, another machine can get another value, right? Because we, in this change, we lock um, value A on all machines at the cost of, on this, when we do all this locking and changing, um, A is not accessible at all, right? So latency will go way up because if I make a request to read A here, I have to wait until all this is all this is done, and finally I get the answer back here. So I get a big 
time layer. So that's when we want to favor consistency over latency. Okay. All right. Um, you know, write requests get queued up until they're unlocked, or read requests get queued up. Um, now, if we favor latency for consistency, um, what do we do? Well, we want to set data three, and so we, we connect to one machine, tell it update value of A, it does so immediately. So at this point now, if a client asks what's the value of A, depending on which machine they connect to, it's either going to be three or two. Right, and now, you know, machine one will propagate the new value to um, machine two. Right, so literally, we have a choice. Do you want um, to make things consistent so that um, whenever you read the value, whoever reads it from whichever machine, you get the same value. That means we have to lock down all the machines, right, we'll make that change. And then unlock those values, and then people can then read the value or write new values. The more, the bigger your cluster, the longer it's going to take to propagate the new value type. And Amazon has a lot of machines, right? Um, I mean, it, they basically have all these huge buildings just full of machines in multiple locations. Um, so for their file system S3, they chose latency over consistency. So that's why in S3, if you write to a updated file, it'll take time for it to propagate to, to all machines that can access it. And then let's see, okay, what do we do when we've got write conflicts? So machine three, one, I want to change A to three. Machine two, I want to subtract one from A. Um, when I get three and one, um, another question is how do we Resolve it when you've got different um, operations done at different machines at the same time. How do we make it consistent? How do we join them together? Um, partitioning, um, we get the same problem. The partition, right? What do we do when they come back together? How do we know? Um, to reconcile two different values. Now this, this cat theorem has been called a theorem for a long time. Um, but it, it is very simplistic. But the goal of it is, right, just to make you think about um, when you got a distributed system, you think about consistency and latency and availability. Mm. But the reason we need to talk about here is because Amazon and S3 has chosen um, you know, to minimize latency over consistency. All right, so S3 favors latency over consistency. Um, let's see how we're doing. 
I think this would be a good time to stop. Um, it doesn't make sense to go too far on this and stop. Plus, there may be a few of you who want to get back to work on assignment two. And there might be some people who were not willing to ask questions at the beginning of class, but maybe ask questions at the end of class. So I'll stop talking at you here. Have any last minute questions? No. See, I'm getting anywhere. No. no one seems to. And I tried a new background. I don't think it worked very well. I can almost see myself. I'll try something different next time. Okay, um, I'll see people on Thursday and keep healthy. I think your background is working better than mine now. <laughs> well, it's an interesting effect though. Hey, I think it's because your jacket is green or like bright green. Maybe he thinks it's a green. Oh, no. No, it's actually black. That's crazy. Yeah, well. Thank you. Okay. Okay, we'll end for here and we'll see people on Thursday. <laughs>